Good morning. My name is Martina Fitzgerald and you are very welcome to this special event to mark World Refugee Day with the official launch of a special documentary and exhibition entitled Home From Home, the story of Syrian refugees in Turkey, which has been commissioned by Goal and supported by the European Union Humanitarian Aid Link Programme. Now, according to the United Nations Refugee Agency, 79 and a half million people around the world have been displaced, the highest number on record. And every two seconds, one person is forcibly displayed due to conflict and also climate change. And the documentary and exhibition being launched today provide insights into the lives of the nomadic, semi-nomadic refugees, and also those engaged in seasonal labor in the agricultural sector in Turkey which over the last six years has registered almost 4 million Syrian and non-Syrian refugees. So as the host of the world's largest refugee population, the Turkish government's hospitality and also the supports that it provides to refugees are widely recognised. And to mark the launch of this special documentary and exhibition and World Refugee Day on Sunday, we are delighted that the former President of Ireland and UN Commissioner for Human Rights and also the current Chair of the Elders, Mary Robinson, will deliver the keynote address this morning. We will also hear from the Chief Executive of Goal, Siobhan Walsh, and other national and international representatives and organisations, many of whom are supporting refugees and the Turkish government. And by the way, if you want to listen in Turkish, please uh, click the translation button on the right hand side of your screen and then select the Turkish option. You can then mute the English language version and listen in real time to the Turkish version. Otherwise, you can continue to listen in English. Now, before we begin, we would like to thank the European Union's Humanitarian Link uh, program and all of GOAL's partners in Turkey and also the United Nations Refugee Agency for their continued support for GOAL's work. And finally, the hashtags for today's event are hashtag GOAL Home From Home and also hashtag World Refugee Day. And if you have any comments or suggestions that you would like to make arising from today's discussion, we will hope uh, that there will be an opportunity later to take questions from the audience and just email goal at homefromhome at goal.ie. And on a personal level, before we begin, as a board member of DOCUS, I'm delighted to be taking part in today's event. So now I want to introduce our keynote speaker today. In 1990, in a historic election, Mary Robinson was elected Ireland's first female president, and she also became the second female head of state in Europe to be elected by popular vote. She subsequently served as UN Commissioner for Human Rights up to 2002. She is the recipient of numerous international awards, including the President Medal of Freedom, which he was awarded by the former US President Barack Obama. Mary Robinson also served as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy between 2013 and 2016 on a number of key issues, including climate change leading up to the Paris Agreement. She remains a passionate and respected advocate for climate justice, for gender equality and human rights in her role as Chair of the Elders, which is an independent group of global leaders which was set up by Nelson Mandela in 2007 to work for peace, justice and human rights. And she is also adjunct professor of climate justice in Trinity College, Dublin. And in all her roles over the decades, she has consistently advocated for the human rights and also importantly, the human dignity of refugees. Will you please welcome Mary Robinson. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, and greetings to you all. Uh, today, as you've heard, we're marking the World Refugee Day 2021 and also the 50th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Status of Refugees. I'm very happy to join Goal and all of you in this event to launch the documentary and exhibition um, on Goal's work with nomadic and semi nomadic refugees from Syria now living in Turkey. And the hat that I thought it was most appropriate for me to wear is my hat, in fact, as chair of the elders. There is no better way to value the lives of refugees and create empathy and understanding of the uh, fact that there are people like us than to tell their story and tell it well and tell it in detail and tell it in all its human aspects. And this is, I think, what both the documentary and the exhibition are doing. And it does create empathy. People really understand these are just ordinary people like us, just 
forced out of circumstances beyond their control to face terrible barriers and have to create new, new lives for themselves. Um, we need many more stories like those shown on the documentary and exhibition today. And what we need to do is we need to learn to weave these stories, these individual stories, into a, a different general narrative, a, a narrative that changes our sense of how we view refugees and migrants um, and uh, how we see them as people, how we take a, a people-centered approach to human migration. Uh, the elders feel very strongly about this. Uh, we are committed to maintaining the spotlight as much as we can on the plight of refugees and migrants, but also see them um, in a more positive light. We want to challenge the negative narrative. We want to support uh, multilateral mechanisms and, of course, UNHCR um, uh, in all its work. And we want to emphasize the benefits to countries of migration. Uh, I'm not, in fact, an expert on Turkey um, and on Turkey's approach uh, to refugees, um, although I recognize, as has been said, that Turkey is the biggest refugee host um, nation with about 3.7 million uh, Syrian uh, refugees. But Lakhtar Brahimi, another elder, and myself uh, visited a camp in Jordan uh, just a few short years ago um, for Syrian refugees. And before we got as far as the camp itself, we became very aware um, that many Syrians don't go into camps in that country, but um, are part of uh, villages and stay in people's homes. And of course, their children affect schools. We heard that uh, schools had to have extra classes. There was no doubt that uh, the number of Syrians in Jordan was a burden on the country. But I was very struck when I asked quite a number, you know, three or four people at different times, uh, you know, what do people in Jordan think about the Syrians who've had to come into the country? And the answer I got was more or less uh, the same from each of the people I asked. And it was a lovely answer. It was, you know, the Syrians are our neighbours. And when they're forced to leave their country, they become our guests. If only this were the global view of refugees, we would be in a much, much better place. It's true that those forced to leave their country through conflict or sadly increasingly because of the climate crisis tend to stay as close as possible to home. So they tend to be in countries like Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon, um, if they're Syrian, because they want to return as soon as possible. And um, the elders have visited other refugee camps, uh, for example, in Ethiopia, which was a camp for South Sudan refugees. Ethiopia has a lot of refugees. Of course, Ethiopia now has the conflict in uh, Tigray, uh, which uh, the elders are also very concerned about. But that's that's a different story. And we've been to a camp in, in uh, Sicily to see how Italy was coping with those who cross the uh, Mediterranean. Um, but uh, the truth is, the world is not managing the problem well and hasn't been for a number of years, and it's getting worse. Uh, the, the figures are very alarming. You know, at least 79.5 million people around the world are forced to flee their homes, uh, either because of conflict, uh, because they're driven out by climate, the climate crisis. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's a very large number. And there are nearly 26 million registered uh, refugees, um, about, of whom about half, or maybe slightly over half, um, are under 18, are children. We're very concerned as elders by the number of climate displaced people already, uh, because they don't, of course, have the status of refugees under the convention. And there's no doubt this number is already increasing and will increase because of the worsening climate impacts, uh, because of the crisis. And uh, this number is probably quite disguised by COVID. COVID is giving countries a health reason to close their borders. And European countries have been doing this. Uh, COVID is on the way out because of vaccines that are not equitably uh, uh, accessed or distributed. But nonetheless, we are coming out of that crisis. We, we need to bear in mind that people will probably move more in the short term after that. 
Um, I was very glad that in January 2020, uh, the UN Human Rights Committee uh, took a stand on this issue. Uh, the H Human Rights Committee ruled that, and I quote, refugees fleeing the effects of the climate crisis cannot be forced to return home by their adoptive countries. That was the important principle established. Actually, as, as sometimes happens in important cases, the person who takes the case may lose um, you know, through facts on the ground. The case was taken by a man from Kiribati um, who applied for uh, protection from deportation from New Zealand, where he was, uh, back to Kiribati, uh, because he claimed that the rising sea level would uh, put his life at risk. And the Human Rights Committee looked at the situation. I think they found um, that he could move from the island where he was to another atoll in Kiribati. In other words, he didn't face the imminent risk to his life if he had to go back to Kiribati. So he lost on the facts. But it actually is very important that that principle has been established. Uh, I have worked with others, particularly when I had my foundation on climate justice, to try to have more security for climate displaced people. Uh, I, I, let me just tell you a story of a friend of mine uh, who works um, precisely now on moving a number of her people from the island where they are to where they have to go. Uh, Ursula Rukova has been working in the Cataract Islands off Papua New Guinea. Uh, the, the island is going under. Uh, she works to move about 1,500 people to Bougainville in Papua New Guinea. And just hearing the story of how this comes about, first of all, they had to go and look at buying land, which they have now been able to buy. They had to meet neighbors in small numbers, you know, get to know who their neighbors would be. And now they've really begun to move and they go by boat quite a distance, but it's the same sovereignty. They're not going to a different country. Um, and when Arisla is describing all of this, she somehow gets sadder and sadder. And at the very end, she says, and there are tears in her eyes when she says this, but there's nothing we can do about the fact that we have to leave the land of the bones of our ancestors. And you get that sense of an indigenous people having to leave the land of the bones of their ancestors. But for every refugee who has to leave, there are terrible memories and reasons for uh, you know, having trauma about having to leave. And that too can be brought out in conversation, in listening, um, in the visits that we've made to uh, the different camps in different uh, countries. Uh, the elders have really felt extraordinarily moved by the stories we've heard um, and an extraordinary affinity with those we've been talking to. There's been a lot of humour, um, a lot of warmth, a lot of sense um, of really valuing the people. I, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll end with Mandela's word, but I'll tell you a funny story of our visit um, as elders to the camp in Ethiopia. Uh, I was with the former president um, of um, uh, uh, Colombia, Juan Manuel um, uh, Santos. And uh, the person who was introducing us said, because she was very proud of it, she said, you know, you've got two presidents visiting you at the moment. And there was an elderly lady there. And her response was, in this home, we are all presidents. And it was just the way she combated the idea of we being somehow elite and we being in her home. And I, I loved it. We all laughed at the, and, and that's important. It's important to kind of uh, see the very human side and feel that empathy and that sense of solidarity. That's what we need to feel more. And that's what Mandela tried to capture in a saying that I want to quote of his, uh, because I always like uh, to bring him into, uh, into the picture as chair of the elders. He said, you can start changing the world for the better daily, no matter how small the action. So, that's what all of you involved in this documentary, in this exhibition, in the work that Gold does in Turkey, and the work that you all do to support as human beings in a people-centered way, the importance of changing the whole narrative and valuing refugees and valuing migrants as being precious to all our countries. Uh, so I commend you for the work you do, and I'm very happy to have been associated with it. Thank you. 
And thank you very much, Mrs. Robinson. And before we move on to our next discussion, we are now joined by the Chief Executive of Gold Global, Siobhan Walsh. Thank you, Martina. And can I just say, Mrs. Robinson, thank you as always for your very human, your very eloquent, um, stirring and, and very, very meaningful address. Uh, you continue um, to inspire, to challenge, and you drive a very important agenda for creating a better world. So on behalf of Goal uh, and all of our staff worldwide and ECHO, thank you for being here today with us. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you, Sinead. And uh, I'm very glad to uh, have been able to promote with you um, this important documentary, this important exhibition, and the work that Goal is doing uh, with Syrian refugees in Turkey. So keep up the good work. Thank you. And thank you again, Mrs. Robinson. I think we all echo the sentiments that Javon has expressed there in relation to your keynote address launching the, of course, documentary and exhibition. And as Chair of the Elders, you rightly continue to put a focus on respecting, on protecting and highlighting the needs of refugees around the world. So thank you again for taking part today ahead of World Refugee Day. Thank you. Now, I am delighted to formally introduce the CEO of Gold, Siobhan Walsh, who has a long history of working in the humanitarian aid sector. And Gold, of course, has worldwide operations in 14 countries in Africa, the Middle East and Latin America, and last year reached more than 14 million people in need in critical areas of health, nutrition, livelihoods and emergency response. And Gold is also working with refugees and displaced communities, not only in Turkey, but also in Colombia, Ethiopia, Uganda, and also South Sudan. So Siobhan, we've just heard that very powerful and emotive uh, keynote speech from Mary Robson launching the documentary and the exhibition today on the Syrian refugees in Turkey. How important is it as we approach World Refugee Day that there is a focus on the plight of refugees and not only in Turkey, but also around the world? Yeah, thank you, Martina. I think it's critically important that organisations like Gold shine a very strong spotlight on the problems of refugees and internally displaced people in our world today, because it's growing, as Mrs. Robinson, it's growing at an alarming rate. Um, you know, the figures have already been uh, stated, but they're almost at 80 million where people have been forced to flee their homes. And as Mrs. Robinson already said, of the 26 million refugees, half of those are under the age of 18. So I'm really, really grateful and I want to extend my thanks to the distinguished panel of speakers that we have here today to talk about this growing problem and to put a spotlight on it and to talk about the 10 years of crisis in Syria, which is becoming even more complex. Our panel will address some of those really important issues, but it's through the documentary and the photo exhibition that we want people to connect on a very human level to the stories of the families, to the men, to the women and the children who are living with this upheaval and they're bearing the brunt of this crisis every single day. So it is our responsibility as an agency to bear witness and to do everything that we can to communicate their stories, to ensure their voices are heard and also to demonstrate their incredible resilience. It is very important, I think, that we continue to find new ways to stave off the, the normalcy that the conflict has become. And that's really, really important. And I am grateful to our EU partners, and, and Jonathan Gray is with us here today, EU Humanitarian Aid, for making this event possible. And I really, really hope that the discussion and the documentary, and I really want all of the people that are online with us here today, I really encourage you to find the time to watch this so that we can keep the issues of refugees and displaced populations on the global agenda. Because, you know, ultimately, Martina, the lasting solutions are only going to come from political settlements because neither Goal nor the wider humanitarian community or the host government countries can meet the scale of the needs of the growing populations that are displaced. So it really does behove all of us to press our leaders to strive for a better outcome for the people, for the families that you're going to see on, um, on the video today. And in terms of the ongoing crisis in Syria, I, I truly hope that in the months ahead that we're going to see that the tentative ceasefire that is in place expanded in a more lasting 
and ambitious political settlement. But I have to say at the moment, it is extremely fragile and complex. We need to do everything we can as a humanitarian community to keep Syria on the, on the world's agenda. And I know the important role that Ireland plays with a seat on the Security Council. As a co-pen holder uh, with Norway for the Syria humanitarian file, Ireland really has a loud voice for multilateralism and humanitarian protection. And we need to use all of our influence to ensure that everything is done to achieve peace and the rapid and effective delivery of essential aid. But while Gold confronts the immediate humanitarian needs in Northwest, we do rely on the international community to address the root causes of the crisis. You know, at Goal, we have an incredible team of people working on the front lines of this crisis every day. And we also have incredibly dedicated partners doing everything they can to respond to the growing needs of families. And I just want to take this opportunity, Martina, just to acknowledge all of the NGOs, the partners, the donors and host governments who continue to respond and continue to adapt as the needs are changing on the ground. Um, and I'm sure they, they will appreciate that very much. Can I ask you in relation to, to Goal, how does Goal support families displaced by this crisis in Turkey and I suppose across the world? Goal supports um, displaced families, Martina, in many different ways and in, in many, many different contexts. And the reality is, is that conflict and, and climate change are two of the primary drivers of displacement worldwide. Because, you know, when people's land um, becomes a desert or a, a battlefield, what choice do people have? They have no choice but to move. And Turkey um, hosts the largest number of refugees in the world today, as Mrs. Robinson's already said. Um, goal is there supporting communities, but we could not do this without the support of the Turkish government. And I really want to thank the ambassador of the Republic of Turkey to Ireland for being with us here today, His Excellency, Mr. Mehmet Hakan uh, Oljai. As protected people, these populations, they are entitled to services, including health and education that is provided by the, the Turkish authorities. And the LINK program that's being implemented in partnership with EU humanitarian aid is helping displaced people to know their rights and to link them to the services available. And so goal is that connector between the services that are being offered by government and helping families understand exactly how they can access those vital supports. My colleague um, Yusuf Nural will provide more details um, on that link uh, program uh, and help people to understand how refugees are able to avail of the protection and services that are available. And there are many, many ways through toll-free hotlines, through rolling out safeguarding response systems, um, providing referral and counselling services in Mersa Adana, Gaziantep and San Lufa. So there are many, many, many components to the programme. But, you know, to answer your question about more broadly in Syria, we are supporting over 1.3 million displaced and host communities in Idlib province and in northern Aleppo with a wide range of, of programmes, including water and sanitation provision, as well as health screenings and the provision of food and non-food items. And Goal is also supporting refugees and displaced people in Colombia and in Gambela in Ethiopia and Sudan. And as to the how, Martina, you said, how do we do it? Well, partnership is really, really important to us because working in partnership helps us to accelerate and to scale our interventions. And in the sector overall, I think it is great that we're seeing new and dynamic partnerships emerging across the board. We need to be working in this way if we want to achieve greater impact in people's lives. Um, I, you know, there's one thing I want to mention. I had the privilege of meeting and spending time actually on a number of occasions with Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, and he was the author of Night. He was a man who was a wonderful listener and he always wanted to know what was happening in the world because he was deeply troubled by the level of human suffering in the world. And I think today it is important to repeat um, some of these words that are often quoted. And he said, when human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Because whenever men and women are persecuted, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. 
And I, they're very, very powerful words and they, they speak to me in a very special way. Uh, and today, as I reflect and we think about our global human family, what we need more of in this world is a lot more love and a lot less indifference and a lot more moments like this where the voices of families are heard loud and clear. So my hope today, Martina, is with this gathering of thoughtful citizens, wonderful people who have joined us here today and our amazing panelists. As Mrs. Robinson said, let's show more empathy and let's remind the millions that are caught in conflict that they are not alone and that we stand with them. Thank you. And thank you, Siobhan, uh, for the very strong uh, messages there in relation to partnership and collaboration. And also, most importantly, thank you in relation to the work that Gold is doing all around the world to help refugees. And just a reminder to everyone that we are using the hashtags today, hashtag Gold, Home From Home, as well as hashtag World Refugee Day this morning. So please join our conversation online. And thank you very much, Siobhan. Again, if you want to make any suggestions about today's conversation, you can email Gold at Home From Home at Gold .ie, and we hope to have time at later uh, for a few questions. Now we're going to move on and we are delighted this morning to be officially launching the Home From Home documentary and photo exhibition, both of which capture the experiences of refugees and migrants in Turkey. So to tell us more about the situation there, I'm delighted to introduce the Protection and Inclusion Officer for Goal Turkey, Yosef Nural. Yosef, you are very welcome this morning. Uh, I'm delighted that you uh, are joining us. Can you first and most importantly give us an update on the refugee situation in Turkey at the moment? Thank you very much, Martin. Of course, uh, Turkey continues to host the largest number of um, Syrian refugees in the world. There is a population of over 3.6 million uh, refugees from neighboring Syria and also several hundred thousand of asylum seekers and beneficiaries of protection mainly originating from different countries, including Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and some other countries. Um, in some of the provinces in Turkey, for example, in Hatay, in Gaza, in Shandabha provinces, a number of refugees uh, comprise uh, the one-fifth of the overall population. A goal also operates in, in the provinces I just uh, mentioned. Uh, for example, in another province, in Kilis, a um, proportion of refugees is, is 74% in the overall population. Uh, when we are talking about the refugee context in Turkey, we are talking about an urban refugee context uh, because 98% of the refugees in Turkey live in urban areas. Uh, and also more than half of the refugees in Turkey, they live in south and south eastern provinces uh, bordering Syria. Um, there are two groups of um, refugees, uh, Syrian refugees and non-Syrian refugees. These two groups of refugees are subjected to um, two different national uh, regulations, um, but both of the regulations, uh, they grant them access uh, to basic services, including uh, healthcare, education and social assistance, as long as they are appropriately registered. Um, these regulations also uh, grant them a right of a legal state. And, and as I said, access to basic services. Um, currently in Turkey, refugees are as vulnerable as ever. Uh, the social and economic, economic impacts of uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, have disrupted the lives of many uh, refugees who were already very vulnerable even before the pandemic. Uh, beyond the significant uh, impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, with loss of jobs and livelihoods, um, unfortunately, we also documented uh, an increase in the adoption of uh, negative coping mechanisms, uh, including child labor and reduced uh, consumption of food and reliance on debt and also decreased use of hygiene materials. Um, this is uh, pretty much about the uh, context uh, in Turkey. And, and Yosef, thank you very much uh, for, for updating us on the situation in Turkey. Obviously, it was very important and you thought it was very important to commission this documentary and exp ex ex ex exhibition to tell the wider world about what's happening. Can you tell us about that decision to, to commission this documentary? Gladly. Um, among Syrian refugees in Turkey, there are lesser known groups, uh, including nomadic and semi-nomadic domain and adult communities. Uh, both of these communities are ethnic minorities from Syria and from neighboring countries. Um, nomadic and semi-nomadic communities, um, they are predominantly mobile uh, uh, communities. They live across Middle Eastern countries, including Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Turkey, and even in the Palestinian territories. Um, 
the semi nomadic and nomadic um, refugees in Turkey, Doms and Abdals, mostly, they live a similar lifestyle to uh, Roman people in Europe. Um, the other lesser known refugee group is uh, those engaged in refugees uh, engaged in seasonal agricultural labor. Uh, refugee seasonal agricultural laborers, they leave their um, place of permanent residence uh, to take part in agriculture, forestry, beekeeping, and fishery activities, uh, but unfortunately uh, live and work under insecure uh, conditions. Uh, they're mostly paid on a um, daily basis uh, and they do not have a permanent uh, employment. Of course, due to their living and working conditions, children, elderly, uh, women, and people with disabilities among them face the greatest burden. Uh, these two groups are among the most vulnerable refugee uh, groups in Turkey because they do not have regular and secure access to services due to language barrier, uh, due to lack of familiarity with legal procedures, and due to their constant mobility. Um, Goal has long been advocating on behalf of these two refugee groups since July 2018. And with the support of European Union humanitarian aid, we agreed to, uh, to, to further raise the profile of these two refugee groups in this documentary as part of our advocacy efforts. Uh, this documentary aims to uh, draw attention to the varied needs of different refugee groups uh, and their experience of forced displacement in Turkey with a focus on nomadic and semi-nomadic refugees and refugee seasonal agricultural workers. We also aim to um, promote responsibility sharing and international solidarity towards uh, assisting refugees. But most importantly, this documentary aims to uh, seeks to uh, demonstrate that despite the challenges um, of supporting these refugee groups due to their constant mobility, it is possible to adapt programming and, uh, and, and build trust with them and also support them and support to reach the poorest of the poor. Thank you, Yosef. And I think uh, it is now fitting, given the context that you have given us, to introduce Alma Sarous, the director of Genbar, which has created the documentary Home from Home. And we're going to have an opportunity to look at a short video of the documentary in a few moments' time. But first, we are delighted that Almas could join us this morning. And just to alert our audience that Almas is going to address us in Turkish and her uh, colleague Gulce Turin will translate uh, her comments immediately afterwards. So over to you, Almas. Teşekkür ediyorum, Martina. Ee, öncelikle hem toplumun içinden gelen bir birey olarak hem de 2013'ten beri toplumla birlikte çalışan e, bir yönetmen ve sivil toplum çalışanı olarak şunu söylemeliyim ki e, Suriye'den gelen Don ve Abdal grupları sadece burada Türkiye'de değil Suriye'de de to to toplumun ötekisiydiler. Tam bu nedenle eşlerinin dostlarının akrabalarının yanına göç ettiler. Bugün e, filmde tanıyacağınız bu toplumla ben 2013 yılında tanışmıştım. İlk tanıştığımda hem eş, dost, akraba bir oluruz hem de inancımızla kendimizi güvende hissederiz demişti birçoğu. E, bir arada oldukları insanlarla yoksulluğu bölüştüler ama daha önemlisi güvende olduklarını hissettiler. Bu çok çok önemliydi. Sekiz sene sonra bu film için bu topluluklarla bir araya geldiğimde Kendilerini güvende hissettiklerini ancak yaşam koşullarının olduğu gibi e, iyileşmediğini gördüm. Bırakın istihdama, eğitim gibi hizmetlere erişmeyi, temel ihtiyaçlarını bile karşılayamıyorlar. Tabiri caizse aslında karınlarını bile zor doyuruyorlar. Bu durum acil müdahale ile eş zamanlı olarak kalıcı ve bütünleşik sosyal politikaların uygulanmasını, daha fazla hizmet vericinin sürece katılmasına gerektiriyor. Daha geniş katılımlı işbirlikleri şart. Bizim bu filmi çekmekteki nihai hedefimiz ve arzumuz görünmez olan bu toplumun sorunlarını görünür hale dönüştürmek, aynı zamanda farkındalık oluşturmak. Şimdi bu filmle birlikte filmi izleyecek her bir birey, Türkiye'de yaşayan mülteci don ve abdal grupları ile mevsimlik tarım işçisi toplulukların yaşamlarına tanıklık edecek ve bu tanıklık en başta bu filmin üretilmesine vesile olan Gol ve Eko bu yaşamlara tanıklık eden her bir bireyin, karar vericilerin, politika yapıcıların, hizmet vericilerin ve aktivistlerin sorumluluklarını da arttıracak. Ben bu biz, bizlere bu süreçte evini yuvasını açan, çayını şekerini eksik etmeyen, dostluğunu sevgisini bizlerden esirgemeyen, 
yaşamlarını ve deneyimlerini paylaşan tüm katılımcılara teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Asıl kahraman onlar, biz kahramanlara destek vereceğiz. Teşekkürler. Dolce. First of all, I must say that as an individual from the targeted community, as a director and a humanitarian worker who has been working with the community since 2013, the Dom and Abdal groups from Syria were marginalized groups of the society, not only here in Turkey, but also in Syria. This is exactly why they mig migrate to the places where their relatives and friends live. I met this community, which you will get to know in the documentary, in 2013. When I first met, they said that we will be together as friends and relatives, and we will feel safe with our belief. They shared poverty with the people they were with, but more importantly, they felt safe. Eight years later, when I came together with these communities for the film, I saw that they feel safe, but their living conditions didn't improve. Not only they are struggling in their access to services, such as livelihoods, education, they cannot even meet their basic needs. They are struggling to survive to to fill their bellies, so to speak. This situation requires the implementation of permanent in, in, and integrated social policies simultaneously with the emergency response and the participation of more service providers in the process. It is necessary to establish cooperation between, with wider participation of the service providers. Our ultimate goal and desire in making this documentary is to make the problems of this invisible society visible and raise awareness. Now, with this film, each individual who will watch will witness the lives of refugee Dom and Abdal groups and seasonal agricultural worker communities living in Turkey. And this testimony will further increase the responsibilities of each individual, decision makers, policy makers, service providers and activists who have witnessed the who have witnessed these lives, especially Gaul and European Union hum humanitarian aid who were instrumental in producing this film. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who opened their homes to us and shared their lives and experiences. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elmas, and also to Kulchev for explaining the context of the documentary. And I think it is now time, and we're delighted to show you a short five minute video of the home from home documentary. Suriye'ye ben geldik. Beş tane çocuğum var abi. Geçimimiz zor abi. Kocam sakat. Maaş zor. Valla Suriye'deki hayatımız keyif içindedik. Keyif dedik. İyi bir hayat yaşardık. Bu savaş olunca, buraya da gelince çok yoksulluk çekti. Cina mecburin oğul şey. Mecburi. Dön futa Türkiye. Oğul şey Suriye mağdır la akil. لا شرب لا غذائية لا معيشة النومة أنت وبدك تنامية ما ضل نومة جانا بس بردان الله رزق وصل بزا غفاشت بزا أولدرمدي جانا ألد بزا سينندردي والله يعني يا بارن رول ميمة جانا بزا بخت يا ورب غصن كي أنا تو أولمشت تمام دين يعني برد الله هيلي كرسين بزا غفاشت بزه سترت بزه ای اولی تسبیح ساتیو چوراب ساتیو بعضی مندی ساتیو 
20 kağıt, 30 kağıt maaşı ediyor. Şükür Allah. Çocuklar ekmek parası. Cina hek al ard hek al sewen yani min belleşin yani şu şu min el hek min el hatab min el oydan hek. Hatta ma nizma kul ma nişteğle hek bakça an ağa. Yani min atlab minu mesela hek şajar hek min sewi çade. Burası Mersin Akdeniz bölgesine bağlı olan Adanalı bölgesidir. Burada yaşayan insanların çoğunluğu çadırda ikamet etmektedirler. Çadırda ikamet eden danışanların çoğu Türkiye'nin farklı illerinden mevsimlik işçi olarak gelmektedirler. Burada biber toplayarak geçimlerini sağlamaya çalışıyor genel olarak danışanlar. Ancak örnek veriyorum Urfa'da kimlik sahibi olup işsizlik problemi sebebiyle Mersin'e gelip Adanalı bölgesinde ikamet etmek durumunda kalmışlardır. Ancak e, kimliklerini değiştirme süreci çok zor olabiliyor, zaman alabiliyor. Bu aşamada sağlık hizmetlerine erişimleri ve e, genel olarak belli başlı hizmetlere erişimlerini sağlayabilmek için bu aşamada bizler yine destek olmaktayız. During COVID, these most basic services have become increasingly difficult to obtain. And that's why that we are here and through our partners such as Goal and Mary, other partners in the Southeast and all across Turkey, we are here to support the most vulnerable people. We were not afraid of the corona, we were not afraid of the work and we were able to work. We were able to work, but because of the corona, we were able to work on our children. We were able to work on our children. We were able to work on our children. We were able to work on our children. We were able to work on our children. We were able to work on our children. We were able to work on our children. What to eat? İş yok, güç yok. Korona işte olduğu için bayıklı yok işte ha, ekmek parası yok. Oraya gidiyor, oraya gidiyor, ha, peş perişanık işte ha, ekmek parası yok. Bak fakir nasıl? Fakir fakirin dilinden anlar. Zengin de zenginin dilinden anlar. Biz ne kadar fakir olsak, göğünümüz zengin, birbirimizden de anlaşırız. Yarım ekmeğimiz olsa onu paylaşır yedik o mahallede. Komşular değil, süreliler değil. E, 2013'ten beri insan yardım alanda çalıştık. Ben de zaten şimdi göl çalışanıyım. Aynı anda mülteciyim. Biz de bir mülteciye ne kadar zor durumlarda olduğunu iyi biliyoruz. Çünkü biz de o biz de o durumları yaşadık. Özellikle uçak evimizi vurdu anda o uçak sesiyle o korku. E, kaç senede Türkiye'den beri ben de o korku yaşıyordum. Bak zamanla atlattım. Artık uçak sesinden korkmuyorum mesela. Valla. <gülüyor> لما بيروحوا جدي وستي على الشغل يعني بيدوروا بالهم علي الجيران والله هيك يعني بحلم يصير عندي اب ام هيك ما اكثر من هيك هيك يعني Now, we have seen there a glimpse of the Home From Home documentary, and we have spoken and heard a lot about the plight of refugees this morning of a, in, in Turkey, but it's quite another thing to, to hear their personal testimonies and see what's happening on the ground. We're joined again by Yosef from Gold Turkey. Yosef, so many powerful stories have featured in this documentary, and for instance, Gold workers and volunteers have helped so many people in relation to to accessing something so basic as healthcare. Can you tell us more about the people that have been helped, tell us their stories, and some of whom have featured in, in this documentary? Yes, Martin, thank you very much. Um, as you saw in the short version of the documentary, all targeted beneficiary groups live in peri-urban and in agricultural areas. And they also often live in, uh, in, live in live outside of the provinces they are registered in. And therefore, they experience difficulties in terms of accessing to services, including healthcare, education, legal remedies, legal aid, uh, and, and social assistance. Um, um, in order to identify our beneficiaries and also in order to identify the most vulnerable ones among them, we conduct intense outreach activities 
and we also make their intakes through toll-free hotlines, and we also accept referrals from uh, other community members and also from other um, um, service providers uh, in, in the area. Um, upon identification and assessment of our beneficiaries, we together make a plan with them as per their needs and issues. And we, we provide them either with direct humanitarian assistance or facilitated support uh, to, to ensure their access to services. Uh, all protection workers in the field um, take actions to provide um, assist. Uh, they take, take actions and provide assistance to reduce their vulnerabilities, to increase their capacities, and also to address and uh, mitigate the protection risks they have. Um, you will see from the long version of the documentary um, that one of our nomadic semi-nomadic beneficiaries, uh, she was assisted to access to proper registration. And, thanks to, uh, and following her registration with the authorities, she was able to access the healthcare services and also give a birth to a healthy child. And this kind of basic facilitative services might seem uh, very simple from outside, but they are very meaningful and important for the beneficiary groups that we are serving to. Um, they are important to an extent that uh, our beneficiary who was able to access the healthcare services with our support, she named her daughter after our protection worker's name. And, and we assist so many people, so many beneficiaries like this with their access to services. Um, and yeah, we, we, we always try to remain as accessible as possible, not only for our existing beneficiaries, but also our future beneficiaries through different means and uh, ways. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Joseph. And we've had a glimpse of an, an opportunity to, to view some of those personal testimonies in, in that short video of the documentary. We're now going to look at a selection of the photographs that feature in the exhibition. And everyone can view the full collection by visiting Gold's uh, interactive gallery at www.goldglobal.org forward slash home from home forward slash. And you will also receive an email directly after uh, today's event contains the link to the exhibition. And please do share the link uh, to the exhibition and documentary uh, with your friends and colleagues because it will increase awareness of the plight of refugees as we approach World Refugee Day and not just in Turkey but across the world. So after today's event you will have lots of opportunities to view the exhibition and also the documentary. And as we previously mentioned, Turkey hosts and supports the world's largest refugee population. And we are delighted this morning that the Turkish ambassador to Ireland has sent us a special message to coincide with the launch of the documentary and exhibition. So we're now going to hear uh, briefly from Ambassador Mehmet Halkan Aljai. Former President of Ireland, Excellency Robinson, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. From the outset, my intention was to participate live at today's event. Yes, yet as you meet, I will be presenting my letter of credentials to His Excellency President Higgins. But still, I wanted to be with you this morning through this pre-recorded message. As we will mark the World Refugee Day in just a few days and the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the 1951 Geneva Convention next month, I would like to thank Gulf for organizing this event. The crisis in Syria, which has entered its 11th year, is unfortunately the largest and the most challenging humanitarian tragedy since the Second World War. A decade of fighting cost hundreds of thousands of lives put more than 30 million people in Syria in need and drove about 7 million people from their homes inside Syria and forced about 6 million people to seek safety in other countries. Unfortunately, the heavy burden created by this long lasting humanitarian crisis has been left to the shoulders of a few neighboring countries, Turkey being at the forefront. Turkish society is an amalgamation of individuals from various backgrounds who have found their home in this land for centuries. Today, Turkey is hosting the largest refugee population in the world with around 4 million forcibly displaced people on, on its lands. In fact, the number of Syrians in our country exceeds even the entire population of some 
EU countries. Since the first day of the crisis, we have followed a human-centered approach towards Syrians seeking protection. So far, we have exerted every effort and mobilized all our resources for them. Billions of dollars have been spent by Turkey, besides bearing many non-material costs, and the scale of which cannot be accounted for. Distinguished participants, in addition to being a safe harbor for Syrians for a decade, Many services, including counseling, language courses, vocational training, health, education, and social services have been provided for millions so as to improve Syrians' living conditions and to ensure their active participation in social and economic life, as well as their self-reliance. With a particular focus to increase resilience, we have launched several initiatives to provide assistance for vulnerable Syrians, including establishing of protection desks, organizing awareness training campaigns and workshops. In order to protect seasonal agricultural workers, including Syrians, we took necessary measures to prevent child labor and enabling their access to education system while improving their living conditions. We have also supported the involvement of Syrian women in the social and economic life, as well as to help the Syrian children to be prepared for future challenges. In this regard, 770,000 Syrian children in Turkey are attending schools. I am very pleased to underline that among them, 49% are girls. I will not list what has been done or how much has been spent by Turkey since 2011, because although the numbers are striking, they are never enough to reveal the real size of the burden we are shouldering. The fact that Syrian babies born in Turkey in the last 10 years have almost reached 700,000 is by itself enough to, compre to comprehend the real dimension of the humanitarian crisis we are trying to cope with. Dear colleagues, accepting millions of people into the society and hosting them for a decade is not an easy task for any country. Unfortunately, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has made the already dire humanitarian situation more complex. By creating added challenges and exacerbating current vulnerabilities, both for the refugees and also for the host communities. Despite these challenges, even during the pandemic, all the measures for the Syrians have been taken by our relevant authorities, including free supply of personal protective equipment, and medicines for treatment, as well as vaccination. Distinguished guests, none of us are free from the challenges of mixed migratory flows. However, neighboring countries carry the burden more than anyone else. Despite all the setbacks, Turkey for the last 10 years has showed an extraordinary solidarity. However, the responsibility sharing by the international community has been unfortunately far from meeting expectations. Our means and sources are not endless. This is a global phenomenon and should be dealt as such. Before concluding my remarks, I would like to thank you for this opportunity on behalf of my country and congratulate Bo for this meaningful event. I wish you success in your deliberations. Thank you very much. And our thanks to Ambassador Mehmet Alkan Aljai, who, as you heard there, has a very good reason for not attending this morning. He is presenting his credentials to President Higgins today, and we wish him well in his new role in Ireland. Now, building on what we have seen and heard so far, we're now going to explore the, the situation in Turkey in more detail. Almost 4 million Syrian and non-Syrian refugees have been registered by the Turkish authorities over the last six years, and around half a million Syrian children have been born in Turkey since the start of the conflict 10 years ago. So to discuss the situation further, I'm delighted that we are joined today by Jonathan Gray, the head of the sub-office of the European Union Civil Protection and Humanitarian Operations in Turkey, whom you might have noticed there in the short video. We're also joined again by Josef Neral, the Global Protection and Inclusion Program Coordinator with, uh, with Goal uh, Turkey. Jonathan, if I can start with you, you've already laid out some of the issues within the video. Can you, can you tell us what is happening at the moment in relation uh, to the situation with the refugees in, in Turkey. Sure, thank you, Martina and Gol, for this opportunity to speak in this forum, and greetings to everyone from Gaziantep, Turkey. As we now know, uh, Turkey hosts the largest refugee population in the world, which is really worth repeating, um, and, and has almost 4 million refugees living outside of camp, camps within the Turkish host community. 
Now, now refugees have been here for some for 10 years, some for five years, and some for a few months. With this huge number of refugees, the government has first and foremost exceptionally made some commendable efforts to provide registered refugees with access to basic rights and services, enrolled, enrolling refugee children into Turkish schools, providing free health care, and also the Turkish population for accepting refugees into their lives. European Union, in close cooperation with the Turkish government, has also been assisting the most vulnerable refugees since 2015, particularly by providing cash assistance to uh, roughly 1.8 million refugees to meet their basic needs, such as rent, food, clothing, etc., and supporting almost 100,000, uh, 700,000 children to go to school, on top of other humanitarian aid projects, which address uh, protection and health concerns. Now, I say this because a lot has been done. However, after years of displacement, many refugee families have completely depleted their resources. They suffer the cost of living in Turkey, which is much greater than that of Syria. Refugees lack access to a regular income, which makes it difficult for um, vulnerable families to meet their basic needs. We see instances of families resorting to negative coping mechanisms, such as child labor, begging, selling of their assets, uh, borrowing money, reducing meals, uh, and are forced to live in substandard housing conditions. And this is all on top of dealing with psychological trauma, which is inherent in war, as we know. So the, the EU focuses on what we call key refugee groups, which is the topic of this uh, its forum, the migrant seasonal agricultural workers and, my, and marginalized communities, such as Doms and Abdels, et cetera as you've just seen in the documentary. And, and as you know, they, they face even greater challenges in accessing these services. Many livelihood opportunities tend to be informal, irregular, such as daily agricultural work, collecting scrap materials. They have poor wages, um, very poor living conditions, as, as you've seen, uh, often in tents. I don't know if you can imagine living in a tent during the winter not to mention suffering from cultural discrimination, not only for their backgrounds, but also for being refugees. And women and children, as we know, often bear the greatest burden of such a, a dilemma with increasing protection risks, you know, forced child labor, child marriage, and even gender-based violence. And as you know, COVID has made the situation clearly worse. Um, given their nomadic culture, uh, seeking uh, seasonal agricultural work, these groups are often on the move and, and much harder to support and much harder to engage in, in education uh, and for us to, to really reach out and, and, and provide assistance to. But luckily we have partners on the ground such as Goal um, to meet their basic needs and, uh, and improve their working conditions and living conditions, which have deteriorated dramatically um, since COVID. So um, also, the, the, we see greater signs of psychological stress, uh, social stress, uh, mental exhaustion due to high levels of fear, worry, isolation, uh, staying at home for many extended periods, constantly worrying about not catching or spreading the virus and, and the well-being of their families. And we even see people not going to hospitals or sending their children to school out of this fear. And Jonathan, uh, you spoke there about the impact of the pandemic, and we saw that on the video, some testimonies. Before I talk to Yosef, uh, obviously that has had an impact on, on the refugees in Turkey. Can I also ask you about the issue of other countries and other donors, the need for them to also provide assistance? Because that is important. No one country can deal with the situation on its own. As I mentioned, the government of Turkey has done exceptional um, work in, in, in providing assistance to these uh, millions of refugees, but uh, no country can do this alone, no donor can do this alone, and no NGO or UN uh, agency can do this alone. So with such a high number of refugees, we, we clearly need uh, a higher level of assistance um, that is currently being provided. And Yosef, if I could turn to you, you spoke about the individuals on the ground that, that Goal is helping. Can you give us an overview of the work that, that Goal Turkey is, is doing and providing, the assistance it's providing to refugees, and what is the best practice that you are adopting in Turkey, and what impact is that having? Of course, Martina. Uh, Goal has been contributing to refugee response in Turkey since 2016. 
And currently, Goal in Turkey have, uh, has two ongoing programs uh, uh, to targeting the most vulnerable refugee groups in South and Southeastern uh, provinces where the highest number of refugees live. Uh, one of the projects that Goal has currently been implementing is the uh, Green Project, uh, which is funded by the Bureau of Population, uh, Refugees and Migration of the State Department of US. Um, the Green Project uh, mostly targets um, vulnerable and excluded uh, women and girls, uh, both from refugee and host communities in, in, in, in Adana, in Mersin and Hatay provinces uh, of Turkey. And it aims to improve their social and economic inclusion, uh, self-reliance and self-sufficiency, and also increase their resilience. Uh, Green is a protection integrated livelihood program and under GREEN, uh, beneficiaries are provided with language and vocational uh, skills training. Uh, they gain skills in greenhouse production systems and also alternative agricultural skills. And as a result, um, uh, they're safe, uh, dignified, sustainable uh, access to um, income generation opportunities in agricultural uh, sector is uh, promoted. Uh, the other project, um, the other goals, the other project uh, currently implemented is the LINK project funded by European Union Humanitarian Aid. Uh, LINK is a protection program and it aims to address and mitigate protection concerns of uh, vulnerable uh, refugees from nomadic and semi nomadic backgrounds and from those engaged in seasonal agricultural labor. Uh, under LINK, uh, both of these beneficiary groups, refugee groups, are provided with direct humanitarian assistance, but also facilitated support and, uh, and information, critical information on their rights, uh, legal obligations, and of the services available to them in Turkey. Um, as in uh, Go currently, uh, under LINK, uh, we provide thousands of uh, refugees with facilitated access to social assistance. We, pro we support children's uh, enrollment to school. We support uh, parents' application for conditional cash transfer for education. We support gender-based uh, violence survivors access to legal remedies and also safe shelters. And we support also thousands of refugees um, access to social assistance, healthcare, legal aid, and also livelihood opportunities. Um, but all uh, supports are not only provided uh, limited to direct assistance, uh, with long-term needs and issues of the beneficiaries in mind, we also conduct sensitization and advocacy activities targeting duty bearers, whether it be civil, humanitarian, or public uh, service providers. And the aim of our sensitization and advocacy activities are to equip respective stakeholders with information and tools so that they can also extend their services to the most vulnerable uh, refugee groups, including nomadic and semi-nomadic groups, and also refugee season agricultural workers. Um, in terms of best practices, um, uh, the unique social and, and economic profile and vulnerabilities of our uh, beneficiary groups actually compelled us to develop different strategies and approaches uh, to firstly identify them, to build trust, their trust to us, and also to provide them with accessible and tailored uh, assistance. Uh, or experience over the last uh, couple of years in working with, uh, with these groups uh, have taught us a number of good and best practices and also lessons learned. Uh, first of all, uh, to begin with um, the identification of nomadic and semi-nomadic refugees and to gain their trust, we recruited community engagement staff uh, who identify them as Doms and Abdals and who are actually very well-known members of their societies and have significant previous working experience in working with Roma, Dome, and Abdal communities. Um, we then supported the development of self-advocacy committees. The committees are, uh, co the committee members are composed of uh, uh, uh, all community members uh, from our target uh, beneficiaries. And we established these committees in all of our program uh, locations, project locations. Um, these, com these committees um, uh, increased uh, participation for uh, beneficiaries in, in the design and delivery of our program activities uh, and also served uh, and, and also um, helped us to empower the community to uh, advocate for their own uh, needs, uh, issues, and also rights. Um, 
We also develop networks with local minority organizations who are targeting nomadic and semi nomadic refugees uh, to enhance their access to services and information and rights. Um, in order to increase our accessibility to our targeted beneficiary communities, we have also established our social support centers within or in close neighborhoods to our beneficiary groups. Social support centers are accessible and open to all community members, and they act as an interface uh, between all social and protection services and, uh, and all targeted community members. Um, of course, our field activities uh, are constantly informed uh, of and adjusted according to the community members' feedbacks uh, collected through our toll-free hotlines, uh, which also serve as, uh, a, com as a communication channel uh, between goal and beneficiaries seeking assistance. Um, or, or assistance, of course, is not... Uh, Sorry, thank you, Yosef, because you've outlined in detail the various programs and supports and also a key message, Shantan, you said that no NGO, no country, no organisation can work alone to help refugees. And I think Yosef has outlined that in detail. And also, I think both the EU and Goal are clearly working in partnership and collaborating for the good of refugees. Before I leave this segment, I just want to ask you, Jonathan, of your hopes in relation uh, to the situation in Turkey, uh, given the pandemic hopefully will be easing uh, because we saw on the video the, the impact of the pandemic on, on, on refugees there. It's a good question, Martina. I would just say that I hope that the refugees are able to live uh, normal lives as, as they would back in their home country or as uh, Turkish uh, population lives. And that, uh, and that we all uh, here, uh, refugees in Turkey, Turkish population, Europeans, and, and, and all of us can, can go back to our regular lives. Uh, that, is, that is a dignified way to, to continue going on and supporting our families and friends. And, yeah. And I think we all support that. And thank you, Jonathan and Yosef. And Jonathan used the word dignity, a word that is regularly used by uh, former President Mary Robson in relation to refugees. Uh, I wouldn't. So thank you for your contributions. And thank you also for your work on the ground in Turkey to both of you, Jonathan and Yosef, for joining us today. Now, thank I would you. like to encourage everyone to again view the exhibition, which is interactive, and there is a guided tour of the images accompanied by a brief description of each photograph on the website, and you to remind you that in your own time you can view the full documentary. And again, ahead of World Refugee Day, I keep going to say this, please post messages online with the hashtag, hashtag World Refugee Day, and hashtag go home from home to help raise awareness about the plight of refugees around uh, the world. And some really stark statistics now, 50% of the world's refugees are children. And it is also worth noting that developing countries host 85% of the world's refugees. There are very stark statistics as we head into the World Refugee Day on Sunday. And I think it was very important that Jonathan and Yusuf provide us with such a detailed context of the situation in Turkey and also of the collaboration between an NGO and the EU and trying to help the situation there. Now, in a short period, we're going to broaden out our conversation to look at the global situation in relation to refugees and the key issue facing them around the world. And I am delighted to welcome our final uh, guest speakers who will be addressing the key theme of encouraging empathy, how we can encourage empathy towards refugees, which is very important. And also, it's a very pressing issue, no matter where you are in the world, because um, refugees are not always welcomed, to put it mildly, with open arms. So I'm delighted to be joined this morning by a panel of distinguished speakers. Um, firstly, we have Barry Andrews, who is a member of the European Parliament, and uh, he represents the Dublin constituency. And he is a former TD and Minister of State 
And as many of you will know, Barry, because he was previously CEO of Gold Global and also a former Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. So you're very welcome, uh, Barry. We're also delighted to be joined by Anastasia Quickly, who is the former chair of the UN Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. So her contribution to this particular conversation will be very interesting. And Anastasia also previously served as chair of the European Union's Monitoring Centre on Racism and chair of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. And of course, here in Ireland, she was a founding member of the Migrant Rights Centre and also the National Traveller Women's Rights Forum. And we're also joined this morning by Philippe Leclerc, who was appointed the representative of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Turkey earlier this year. And Philippe held a similar post in Greece since 2015. And he has spent three decades working for the United Nations Commissioner for Refugees in several countries, including Afghanistan, Syria, and Central and in Central Africa. So we're delighted to get your perspective this morning. And finally, we're joined by Anna Uprishan, who is the manager of the Romact program, which is a joint initiative by the Council of Europe and the European Commission to assist authorities together uh, with local Roma communities to develop inclusive policies and public services. And Anna has extensive experience working in community development and humanitarian aid in Turkey, in Iran, in Pakistan, Bangladesh and Syria. And thank you, Anna, for joining us today. And I'm going to start this conversation very simply uh, and noting the theme of this conversation by asking each and every one of you how we can encourage empathy towards refugees, given sometimes uh, the reception they receive. And I'm going to start with you, Barry. Well, uh, thank you very much, Martina. It's a, it's a real honour to uh, to be with such a distinguished panel. And I think the answer to the question for me is always to humanise the stories of refugees. And that's why today's uh, exhibition and documentary are really contributing to that. Um, and I think Mary Robinson touched on it a little bit earlier, telling the stories of individuals and how their lives are, because sometimes we get uh, we get hit by blizzards of st statistics. I think the other thing is that we need to address some of the misconceptions. And you just outlined two very important points, namely that the vast majority of refugees are in developing countries. And also what we, we've forgotten somewhat is so many refugees are children. And we also have to remind ourselves that there are a lot of protracted crises and so the humanitarian model was designed to help refugees to survive, uh, uh, to provide temporary protection. But now, um, as the ambassador pointed out, 700,000 Syrians have been born in Turkey. So the humanitarian system has to adjust, in my opinion, to uh, longer term interventions, not just about surviving, but thriving. Um, investing particularly in, in children's education. And I was delighted to hear that goal of providing those services or access to those services in Turkey in such a, in such a fantastic way. Thank you very much, uh, Barry. And I'm now going to move to Anastasia. Anastasia, what how would you see different countries tackling that issue and encouraging empathy toward, towards refugees? Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina. And can I, at the outset, congratulate Goal on the courage that they've shown in the last 40 years in being in the front line of humanitarian responses uh, to the needs of refugees. But in doing so today, as we approach International Refugee Day, I'd like to salute also the courage of refugees themselves globally, and also of those who are seeking international protection and to have their status as rec refugees recognised throughout the world. I'm very conscious also, though, in speaking to empathy of the way in which empathy is somewhat obfuscated by uh, not going that little bit further that you were talking about, Barry, looking to how refugees can thrive, looking to how asylum seekers can thrive. And for me, globally, that is about an acknowledgement of their rights. And I'm very conscious also as someone who's been directly involved in this country and in Europe with Roma and with travellers, including at the moment as chair of Pavy Point, for example, I'm very conscious of the way in which, for example, nomadism is criminalised uh, or uh, if not criminalised, at least um, seen as beyond the pale, to use a term we use in Ireland, of, of what's considered appropriate 
and how much it challenges those of us. Whereas on one hand, we support some of us to move around the world at great speed, or we used to before COVID, and now we, we challenge that. But to go back to your key question, Martina, I think there, there is an importance in linking uh, the different levels uh, on one hand, we have a number of really useful global instruments in human rights treaties, but then we have global compacts in UN human rights treaties, and we have global compacts on migration and on refugees, which don't have the same status as those treaties, and then we have the commitment to the sustainable development goals. I think we need these to be integrated, and I think countries need to take their commitments onto them much more seriously, uh, because in effect, they have within them, if you look to, for example, the first provision in the Sustainable Development Goals, it's very clear about uh, addressing the needs of those who have heard this behind first. So I think we need to do that. Secondly, and we've talked a good bit about the European level, I, I do believe, and I'm very interested to hear of the civil protection and humanitarian operation that has been ongoing EU operations in Turkey. And there are some very commendable EU interventions, including also the equality legislation, which should of course apply to everyone. And maybe one of the things we need to be very clear about when we talk about that move from empathy to thriving and to rights, we need to be very clear about talking to citizens and not just to citizens, but talking, talking also to residents, whatever their status in any of our countries. And in, the, in, in that regard, I have to express some concern about the EU pact on migration and asylum and the, the way in which we need to maybe match our concerns, which are so ably demonstrated in the work that people have been speaking about here this morning, match our European Union concerns with humanitarian aid and with rights, I hope, with uh, the provisions of that pact which do fall short, in my view, fall short particularly when we talk about external examination of people at borders, the rights of returns, and also when we the right to return. And we talk in particular in that pact also about uh, the, um, the when, when we talk in particular on that pact uh, on uh, external um, screening and also on returning and on guidance with regard to mandatory uh, laws for protection rather than what's permitted under those, which is particularly relevant on the Mediterranean. And then lastly, since we're in Ireland, or since I'm in Ireland this morning, I know most many of you are not, I'd like to speak also maybe to our concerns and what we can do. I'm very conscious that we now have a white paper, which is looking to make sure that anyone seeking international protection here has their own front door. Uh, we, I'm part of the group nationally that's developing a national action plan against racism, and we have impending hate crime legislation. But I think we, we, we still need to look to that, uh, that welcome that's required. And I'm, I'm very, I would like to commend Turkey and all I've heard about Turkey during the morning. But I think globally, we do need to, to, to look to the welcome that's required and to acknowledge the realities of racism, which is something that is inflicted on refugees and asylum seekers. Acknowledge it as something that's not about a hierarchy of oppression, but has become a global toxic discourse fueled in the last decade by some global leaders. I feel we have a moment now, a moment maybe accompanied by what Mary Robbins spoke about as the terrors of conflict and also climate displacement. And thirdly, COVID, where migrant workers and refugees and asylum seekers have played front frontline roles in creating conditions where it could be addressed, but now have differential access to the vaccines that might speed its uh, alleviation globally. I think we have a moment when we might Anastasia, be able to I think you've raised so many issues there and so many ways. There's a long list there of to-dos in terms of encouraging empathy and that warm welcome to refugees. And I think, Philippe, this is a good opportunity and time for you to, to input your advice on how countries from a United Nations perspective because you've worked in so many countries that have been affected and obviously you're in a good you have a good perspective in relation to how the United Nations is dealing with this and encouraging more countries uh, to evoke empathy towards refugees. Well thank you very much Martina thank you to Goal for having organized this uh, event which again uh, through its photographs through the film show what the needs are and how um, the resilience that we refer to often when, when talking about refugees uh, exists. But having, as you have said, uh, worked with refugees throughout the world for the last 30 years, uh, this has been my main motivation as well as a, a humanitarian worker, a lawyer, uh, working uh, to defend 
and allow uh, refugees to have as a normal life as possible. I think what I have heard the refugees tell me over time is that they would not like to need this resilience that much. What we need to do is to ensure that they have as normal lives as possible, as many of you have, have referred to. And this requires a legal framework. It, it requires policies. And I'm very happy, actually, that uh, I have been designated by the High Commissioner as representative in Turkey, because it also shows, and I think it's very important to, as UNHCR, uh, to show that uh, despite the high number an extraordinary number of people hosted by Turkey for uh, more than 10 years, if we talk about the Syrians, but many others as well, Afghans, Iranians, uh, and also migrants uh, from Bangladesh, from uh, Pakistan. It is possible because what I have heard often in the la latest positions I had as representative of UNHCR in Greece and in, in, in France, my own country, and the general debate that we hear in Brussels and in many capitals of EU member states or Europe is that it is so difficult when, as Barry has said, 90% uh, of the refugees are living in low or middle income countries who are close uh, to uh, the conflict. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, uh, Turkey and Iraq are hosting most of the the, the the Syrian population. Pakistan and Iran have been hosting for more than 40 years, uh, most of, uh, I mean, up to five to six million uh, Afghans. And uh, with the instability possibly coming up uh, in September, uh, we also have to prepare again uh, for possible influx and, and being able to deal uh, with uh, uh, supporting Afghans who may, I hope not, uh, have to flee again uh, some disorder. So. What I, I really uh, think, uh, to respond to your question, what is needed to create empathy is, as we have seen today in the first part of your, uh, of your event, is to show the humanity of each of these individuals. And this is, again, what is motivating me after 30 years to continue, to be able to make a difference as quickly as possible. Again, and I will take today as representative in Turkey, and uh, even for a couple of months, because with these 4 million people, the policies that they are framing are the ones that we encourage any state in the world to do, which is not to put people in camps, uh, unless it's an emergency situation. But uh, as you know, sometimes camps uh, have people living for 17 years as an average. And, uh, and some uh, people, for example, in uh, Thailand, uh, have been were, were born in a refugee camp and die in a refugee camp. So. One, one important dimension is to, as early as possible, uh, include uh, refugees and, uh, and people of concern in national inclusion programs, as it is done in, uh, in Turkey. Access to health, access to education, access to livelihoods, of course. And this, uh, as we have heard again, uh, COVID-19 situation, as well as uh, some deterioration of the economic situation, has made it more difficult. And uh, we have seen the semi-nomadic nomadic people in the rural areas of Turkey having so many uh, difficulties. But I still want to show the hope and the responsibility that Turkey is providing to the whole world by having these national inclusion policies. And thank you, Philip. Your connection is just breaking slightly there. Thank you for, for your contribution. Uh, I think Philip's uh, connection has just broken there, but we will return to him shortly. Can I can I turn to you, Anna? Because from a different perspective, you have dealt with the Roma community uh, across Europe. Can I ask you how you believe countries should encourage empathy? And then we will return to the rest of the panel to continue our conversation. Social cohesion. That means talking, talking, talking. Never stop talking uh, to uh, to uh, together. And UNHCR sees it as a, as a possibility as its main role, actually, apart from all the implementation advice that we can provide and uh, and through the, the support we get from the donors. But enabling 
people to talk together and reflect that talk to uh, wider audiences is the best way possible to show the humanity of uh, children, parents, grandparents uh, when they are together. Because usually, because uh, last word, uh, I have seen, of course, many children are in need. The elderly are often less, left totally apart and they are the ones in Syria uh, waiting to die for many of them without having seen their grandchildren and, and, and, and, and, uh, and parents. So I will stay on that to also think of the vulnerable elderly in many situations. Philippe, I think that was a very important point to to to finish your contribution there on. Anna, in relation to empathy uh, and encouraging empathy uh, in in other countries, what what would you what would you advocate? I'm I'm not sure the connection is a bit uh, difficult. Okay. Do you refer to me, uh, Anna. Exactly. Anna, can you explain to us what you would propose to encourage empathy uh, towards refugees? Well, I think, first of all, uh, that we rather tend to have this generic approach towards the, the groups that we serve. When it comes to the Roma, it's the same thing. We speak about Roma in general, like there is one single group with the same kind of needs or the same kind of specificities, which is not true, actually, across Europe and the Middle East as well. And we have in the Middle East, we have the Dom and the Abdal. They have different needs and different, you know, different culture, different uh, customs. Therefore, approach should be uh, adjusted. Um, when it comes to refugees, and when it comes to refugees in Turkey, we have the same thing, I believe. Obviously, we from the from the from the uh, a need to approach everybody in an equal way, we tend to to to, to approach everybody the same. However, equality is not equity always. And I'm referring here to the fact that in Turkey, among the Syrian refugees, we have groups of people that are rather different. You have the Dom and Abdal, that when they come into the country, uh, they don't necessarily prefer to stay in the same places where the other Syrian refugees stay. And I have um, the experience of uh, meeting with a lot of families both in, in Gaziantep back in 2013, actually, both in Gaziantep and, and in Diyarbakir, that they got settled on the top of the houses of the local Dom population, for example, or at the outskirts of the cities where they just live in tents. And as far as I heard right now, for example, some families that used to rent the top of the houses of the Abdal neighborhoods due to the COVID situation don't, um, don't have the resources uh, any longer to, to, to sustain that and they had to move in tents. What I'm trying to say is that we need to know these different groups. The same way as when we speak about Roma policies uh, in Europe, we have to have a tailored approach. We have to know the groups, we have to know who they are, what their customs are, what their religion is, what they would, would um, welcome as support and whatnot, because there's a matter of using resources wisely. Um, and use resources wisely when you actually uh, uh, target them to the specific need. We tend to have these very broad programs, you know, like, and, and thinking that one solution fits all problems, but it's not necessarily true. And we have been seeing this when it comes to the Roma uh, policies uh, over decades, that the impact hasn't been after using a lot of funding and, uh, and, and, and pressure from the European Union to the governments, um, national governments, still the impact is not there, the Roma, uh, already move towards the Western European countries and in Turkey as well. We have people who came from Syria, Domari, for example, the Dom, whom we know now, for example, that they move towards different other Roma or Dom uh, uh, groups or families in Brussels, for instance. Um, when it comes to Turkey, uh, Turkey uh, has had an, an attempt, let's say, it's not is not there yet in, in targeting and having a strategy for the, for the Roma in Turkey. I say again Roma generically because in Turkey, in terms of policies, they, they uh, address the Dom, the Lom, and the Rom, and similar groups with similar lifestyle, hence the Abda. For example, the program that I'm working on, which is encouraging the partnership with local authorities um, and the local communities, the local disadvantaged communities, um, is going in the next period actually to, to be present in, in Gaziantep and to um, 
actually deal with the local population in, in, in need, but up down. And we have the refugees that you cannot ignore them. And what I want to say is that the policies or the measures that will be negotiated with the local authorities should include these refugees, these groups, even if they are not citizens of the country. Thank you very much, Anna. And I'm now going to, to move along. It was a big opening question to ask you how to encourage empathy uh, towards refugees. It's an equally difficult and big question that I'm going to end with everyone. It, how, I suppose, if, there, if you were in a position, what single action would you implement that would improve the situation of refugees as we look ahead uh, to World Refugee Day? And Barry, you have visited camps in your former capacity as, as head of goal. You are now sitting as a policymaker at a European level. So you have uh, various perspectives on this. What, what would you do if you could? What would be the single biggest action that would result in change as we look towards World Refugee Day? And I realise if, if everybody could keep their contributions uh, brief, uh, but it's a huge question and I accept that. Well, I, as, I, I was, as a politician, I gave the shortest answer in the first round, which is uh, something I'm sure you're going to expect. Very unlike a politician. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and I will, I will be, I will be brief. Um, and Anastasia touched on this issue of the pact on migration and asylum. Um, it died of natural causes in the last European Parliament under the last Commission, and it has now been republished uh, in last year, in 2020. And it is beginning its very slow uh, route through the legal processes uh, here in the European Union. There are five legislative acts, Martina, and, and two uh, non-legislative instruments. So it's an enormous piece of work. Um, and the European Parliament is very ambitious. I believe the European Parliament is very progressive about refugees. Um, and I think that we won't stand in the way. I think what will happen is the member states um, have far too much regard for right-wing uh, conservative narratives around refugees. Um, I think that we have an enormous uh, obligation as both activists and politicians to consistently uh, push this le legislative agenda and force member states to confront the humanitarian consequences of conflict and climate and disease across the world uh, on some of the most vulnerable communities. And uh, frankly, I think we're losing that battle, uh, certainly at the member state level here in the European Un Union, uh, where uh, the growth of right-wing parties in the last five or six years uh, has given uh, an, an opportunity to uh, impose very uh, negative and securitized policies uh, towards vulnerable populations. So that's the one thing I will be pushing very hard for. It's it's in uh, my domain and I, I look forward to the debates here in the Parliament on that, Martina. And by the way, Barry, I, I would like to acknowledge your timeliness in relation to your first contribution, to be fair. It, are you optimistic, before I move on to Anastasia, are you optimistic in relation to it? Uh, or what would your viewpoint be? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be uh, very optimistic. I generally tend to be an optimistic person, um, but uh, because but I think once we get past key elections next year, if I may say that, uh, there may be a, a, an easier glide path uh, for the this legislative uh, ambition that has been set out by the Commission. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure. I think the 50-50 to get this completed during the current mandate. And thank you, uh, Barry. Uh, Anastasia, it's a big question. Uh, what single action would you bring about to improve the situation of refugees ahead of World uh, Refugee Day if you were in a position to do so? Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge question. Well, um, it has to be quicker this time, maybe. But I think the big, the big thing which everybody has said this morning and which is fairly well known is reframing our thinking away from our needs, you know, and by our, I mean, glo white, global, Western, settled, as opposed to nomadic peoples, away from our needs to their human humanity and their rights. You know, I think, uh, and for that means, that for me, that means a couple of things. It means, Anna has said it, one size does not fit all. Barry has said it as well uh, about the, the need to be optimistic at the moment. I think we can be optimistic, but it also means for me, 
real participation by refugees and asylum seekers themselves in decisions that are getting made about them. In all of our institutions, nationally, regionally in Europe and globally, we're, we're very clear about uh, participation and we, we talk euphemistically about it. And at the same time, we don't allow those voices to be heard. And very frequently in humanitarian terms and in rights terms, they have simple, straightforward things to say that, that make a huge amount of sense. And then lastly, it seems to me as well, to make all those things happen, we need to, in terms of one size not fitting all, we need to acknowledge differentials in power between women and men. Uh, we need to acknowledge it, what, what happens with children. And we need to take all of that on board. So in a way, for me, it means, first of all, um, doing that shift. And secondly, going the road less traveled, having the courage to uh, look at what that might mean. We've had to face ourselves in the past year due to COVID globally. And I think we temporarily succeeded from a public health perspective in inaugurating some changes. I think we need to try to continue in an optimistic way along that path in, in, in human terms and in human rights terms. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much uh, this morning, Anastasia. Uh, Philippe, it's your turn to ask a very big question that I'm sure uh, is a central one for the United Nations. What's the single biggest action that could be taken uh, at a global level to improve their plight? So rather than uh, going to the refugee uh, himself or herself that I, I mentioned before, and, uh, and uh, indeed agreeing on participation, particularly at the municipality level, which is really mm -hmm. very important, I would now step to the global uh, uh, level and actually uh, challenge a bit Anastasia saying that uh, on, on why a global compact on refugees uh, while we have uh, rights-based uh, instruments, including the convention uh, protecting them, the, the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, what is missing in the system? And it's so uh, clear today as the refugees and internally displaced number growth and the High Commissioner will be mentioning the latest numbers uh, uh, tomorrow uh, of 2020. What is missing is the responsibility sharing part in particular and 90% again of the refugees throughout the world are not in Europe, are not in the US, are not in the in the industrialized world but they are elsewhere and what we are asking uh, these states, the European states, um, the US and, and others is to do and go far beyond in terms of responsibility sharing and not shifting responsibility as we often hear, uh, particularly recently in London and Copenhagen by externalizing asylum. I don't want to be technical here, but but we it's not what we are asking for is not shifting responsibility, but true responsibility sharing. And this means, of course, uh, funding uh, those states which are uh, have good programs, uh, inclusive programs, as we have mentioned, to uh, include the refugees in their uh, policies. But they also need to allow resettlement. Responsibility sharing is also not only paying, but allowing legal pathways so that persons, and particularly those who are the most vulnerable in these states where they are living, can benefit, come from the support of industrialized states through far stronger and sub robust uh, resettlement uh, possibilities. So I'll remain at the global level. And if these two elements would uh, progress, definitely it will make a difference for many families throughout the world and the hosting and communities hosting them, of course. And to be fair, to be Philippe, and Philippe, Philippe, Philippe, I'd say that I wasn't, I wasn't going to do away with the pact. In fact, what I would like to do is have it strengthened to have the same status as some of the other instruments. Sorry, sorry. Uh, and, and just uh, no, as no. we are having this dialogue, uh, the 51 Convention, uh, sadly, I think we would not get it today with the whole uh, yes. member states of the United Nations we have today. So we have to preciously keep it and, and indeed uh, build on it and have this convergence between global pact and, uh, and in, in international human rights instruments. Okay, and Philip, you also touched on two key issues, resettlement responsibilities and funding responsibilities, and to share the responsibilities in partnership, not just a lip service of using the word partnership. Okay, to Anna, the big question, how would you solve this issue if you were in power in the morning? Uh, how, what single action would you take? Yeah, as I said before, a single action or uh, solving a problem with the magic stick does not really work, although some people would expect that to, to happen. Uh, but I do agree with the fact that, um, especially in the case of uh, families that 
that uh, came to Turkey, for example, were within a, a certain country quite up to 10 years ago, uh, they're no longer <laughs> temporary there. They should be, there should be certain measures that should address them through policies, through local policies, through the attention of the, of the local authorities. So sharing this responsibility, not, um, not having, having only aid agencies providing emergency support, this cannot go on forever, but uh, as long as the people are there, the local authorities should be supported to actually take this in hand and implement policies that address these, these people living on their territories. And obviously not by just doing certain things, throwing money at the problem and, and, and serving, but actually having the beneficiaries, having these people involved, having them participating in finding solutions, finding, developing, designing measures, um, short-term and longer-term measures for their, um, the improvement of their situation and longer term sustainability. So look and thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we've heard some common themes today, partnership, responsibility, dignity, and of course, Barry, I think you said it from the outset of your contribution that refugees, it's not just about surviving, it's about thriving. And that is a, a fitting way to end this discussion. Uh, and thank you to Barry, to Anastasia, to Philippe and to Anna, and to Deed, to all our guests today for their contributions and greatly enhancing our discussion and understanding of the issues in relation uh, to refugees around the world. And it truly was a global perspective with our last guest speakers. Thanks also again to Mary Robinson for her part uh, speech and contribution. And of course, thank you all for attending today's event. We, of course, would have preferred to have met you in person, but we are pleased that the virtual event has allowed everyone to join from around the world and, and to join this important discussion in the lead up to uh, World Refugee Day. And just to remind you, uh, after this event, you will again receive an email from Go containing a link to view the photo exhibition, the documentary, and also today's event, as well as links uh, to other useful and important resources and more information about the EU Link program. And you can find everything in one place at goglobal.org forward slash home from home forward slash. And please spread the word about World Refugee Day using the hashtags, hashtag goal home from home, or hashtag World Refugee Day. And your active participation has helped the EU and goal to shine a light on the experiences and everyday lives of Syrian refugees in Turkey. And the video and subsequent discussions have highlighted, I suppose, the impact of the horrors of war on people. We were once again reminded today that most of the Syrian refugees in Turkey had very decent and stable lives before the conflict, lives that have changed, changed beyond belief and they have lost their homes, their jobs, and many have lost loved ones. And we saw that through their, their testimonies on that video. And we know the, the effect of mass displacement is very difficult, both for the refugees and also uh, for the countries and communities that host them. And supporting refugees with humanity and dignity, that word again, must continue to be our responsibility. And on that note, Turkey deserves a recognition for providing so many refugees with protection, a home and essential services. And Goal has worked with the Turkish authorities, EU humanitarian aid and other partners to respond to this huge challenge. And collectively, we have heard again and again, and particularly in that last conversation, for the world to step up and share the responsibility. And most of all, striking today, the discussion highlighted that we must provide more than communities, more than just a, a tent over their heads. It's what Barry suggested. It's not about surviving, it's about thriving. And we must also find ways to provide hope for their future and their children's future. And finally, as we were as we approach World Refugee Day, uh, Gold is appealing to the international community to continue to support support Syrian refugees and all refugees worldwide who are unable to return to their homes safely. And on that very important note, thank you for joining this important conversation today and thank you for everyone to contribute and as we approach World Refugee Day on Sunday. Thank you. <laughs>